So now we just have to use algebra to solve for this unknown. Um, is your algebra good enough to solve this equation? Um, we'll go through the algebra for that. So um, what does it mean to solve an equation? We need to get this adjacent term by itself. If we could just rearrange the equation so the adjacent term was by itself, we'd be in good shape. Well, notice that we've got a fraction here on the right-hand side of the equation. Anytime you have two fractions that are set equal, you can get rid of the fractions by cross-multiplying. Anytime you have two fractions that are set equal, you can get rid of the fractions by cross-multiplying. That's a really useful algebra trick. If you have two fractions that are set equal, you can get rid of the fractions by cross-multiplying. For example, how would you solve this equation? Well, here we have two fractions that are set equal to each other. We can get rid of the fractions by cross-multiplying. Uh, what does cross-multiplying mean? Well, we multiply diagonally. We multiply diagonally. So we would have 5 times x equals 6 times 3. Can you see that this would be considered cross-multiplying? We multiply the 5 and the x, multiplying diagonally. And then we multiply diagonally the other way. We multiply the 6 times the 3. That's what it means to cross-multiply. Anytime you have two fractions that are set equal to each other, you can get rid of the fractions by cross-multiplying. Do you notice that the really handy thing about cross-multiplication is that the fractions now are gone? Fractions are difficult to deal with. Anytime we can get rid of fractions, we should be happy. Well, this new equation here doesn't have any fractions in it, so it will be much more easy to deal with. All right, I'm not going to go through the next step and show how to solve this equation. I just wanted to show how we can use cross-multiplication to get rid of fractions. Anytime you have two fractions set equal to each other, you can cross-multiply and get rid of the fractions. Try cross-multiplying to simplify this equation. Pause the video and cross-multiply to simplify this equation. I hope you wrote that down. Well, cross-multiplying means multiplying diagonally. Multiplying diagonally would give us 5 times x. And multiplying diagonally the other way would give us 3 times 4. And now we've gotten rid of all the fractions. So that's what it means to cross-multiply. Uh, when you have two fractions that are set equal to each other, um, you cross-multiply by multiplying diagonally one way and then multiplying diagonally the other way and setting those two products equal to each other. Uh, and then you could proceed to continue to solve this equation. We won't continue to solve this equation, uh, but you can see this equation is easier to work with because we've gotten rid of the fractions. Well, here we have a fraction. Now, we can use cross-multiplication to simplify this. Now, at first you might object that we don't have two fractions that are set equal to each other. But we kind of do. If we want to make the left-hand side into an equation, we can easily do that. How can we... I'm sorry. If we want to make the left-hand side into a fraction, we can easily do that. How can we make the left-hand side into a fraction? Well, I hope that you're familiar with the idea that you can make anything into a fraction if you just put it over 1. We can make anything into a fraction if we want to by just putting it over 1. So now both sides of this equation are fractions. And now we can cross-multiply. Remember that cross-multiplying means multiplying diagonally. Well, we have 1 times the adjacent. one times the adjacent, and multiplying diagonally the other way, we would have five times the cosine of 30. I hope you can see that this is what we get when we cross-multiply. Multiplying diagonally one way, we have one times adjacent, and multiplying diagonally the other way, we have five times the cosine of 30. Cross-multiplying means multiplying diagonally one way, and then multiplying diagonally the other way, and setting those two things equal. And this is a lot easier to work with because now we've gotten rid of all the fractions. All right. Now, remember, our goal is to get this adjacent term by itself. So we haven't quite accomplished that because the adjacent term still has a number next to it, the number 1. And that really shouldn't bother us very much because we know that 1 times anything is just that thing. 1 times the adjacent side is just the same as the adjacent side. So don't, we don't really have to write this number 1 down separately. 1 times the adjacent is just the adjacent. Okay, and now we're ready to plug into our calculator. 
we can use our calculator to find the cosine of 30. On your calculator, the cosine of 30 is 0.87. That has to be multiplied by 5 still, so I'll put that in parentheses to indicate the multiplication. The cosine of 30 is 0.87. Well, I hope you have your calculator with you and that you've typed in the cosine of 30 and gotten 0.87. Um, by the way, what happened if you plugged this in and you didn't get 0.87? What if you got uh, 0.15 instead? If there's anyone out there whose calculator says that the cosine of 30 is 0.15, that's because you're in the wrong mode. You're in radians mode when you should be in degrees mode. So again, what you should have gotten for the cosine of 30 degrees is 0.87. Uh, if there's anyone out there whose calculator said that the cosine of 30 is 0.15, that's because you're in the wrong mode. You're in radians mode, and you need to change to degrees mode. Um, if you have a TI-83 or a TI-84 calculator, you can do that by pressing the mode button and then changing to degrees and out of radians. If you have a different type of calculator, you'll just have to um, figure out how to change between degrees and radians mode. But anytime you're using trigonometric functions, you have to make sure you're in the right mode. Um, in this series of videos, I think we're just going to be focusing on degrees, not radians. In fact, I'm not even going to explain what radians are right now, if you haven't heard of them. Uh, but you have to be working in degrees. Um, so make sure anytime you're using your calculator for trig that you're in the right mode, either degrees or radians, if you're in the habit of going back and forth between the two things. In any case, here you can check. Um, hopefully your calculator told you that the cosine of 30 was 0.87. If that's the number you got, then you're in the correct mode, degrees mode. But if your calculator told you that the cosine of 30 was 0.15, you need to change your mode. You need to change out of radians and into degrees. Anytime you're trying to do trigonometry and the answers aren't working out right, um, maybe you're in the wrong mode. You might have to change into degree, degree mode. Or sometimes you might have to change into radian mode if you're working with radians. But in these videos, we're going to work with degrees. So please make sure your calculator is in degrees mode. All right, and now we can do this multiplication on your calculator. 5 times 0.87 is approximately 4.3. So we get the adjacent side is 4.3. We can go ahead and write that down over here. The adjacent side has a length of 4.3. Well, what do you know? We've used trigonometry to figure something out about a triangle. Um, so what we're trying to do here is see how the uh, trigonometric functions are useful. Well, now we can start to see how they're useful. Even though we were only given one of the sides and one of the angles, we were able to use cosine to figure out another side. So now we're starting to see the usefulness of the trig functions. In these videos, I'm not going to be discussing significant figures. I'm not going to round the answers off to the correct number of significant figures. I'm just going to round them off to what feels comfortable. So this is not necessarily the correct number of significant figures here. I just rounded off to what felt comfortable. 